Pulaski? Present. Mr. Eckman? Present. Dr. Lazartev? Okay. Ms. Laredo? Present. Ms. Chappelle? Present. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Dr. Warner? Present. Dr. Waterhouse? Here. We have a quorum. Excellent. Uh, agenda item number two, committee chair remarks, of which I have some, um, but I'm going to hold off until later. So we'll ask if any committee members have comments. According to that list, Dr. Warner and I work for the DMV. <laughs> <laughs> Can't help you there. <laughs> we need our connections. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, may we have uh, any audience members participating that would like to introduce themselves and give their affiliation? Good morning. This is the moderator. Would you like me to open up the Q&A panel to enable them to speak? Yes, please. This is the moderator. I have opened up the Q&A panel. If you would like to introduce yourself and state where it is you are affiliated with, please feel free to submit a comment in the comment box and submit it so we can unmute your microphone for those introductions. Dr. Pollard, it does not be, it does not appear that anybody has submitted a request to do an introduction. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Moving on, agenda item number three: public comments on items not on the agenda. And moderator, may I ask you to open up the Q and A again to address this? Absolutely. The Q&A panel has been opened. Before we get started, I would like to remind individuals that if you would like to make a public comment, we are asking for very specific instructions followed, which are displayed currently on your screen. Please indicate that you would like to make a public comment, at which time your microphone will be unmuted and you will be given two minutes. I will take all comments in the orders they are received. I will pause for a moment for you to locate this feature and submit your request. Mr. Chair, it does not appear we have received any requests. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Okay. Um, hope everybody got a chance to find and review the minutes. Agenda item number four is review and approval of the January 29th, 2020 MDC meeting. Minutes, please. Any committee comments or corrections? May we have a motion to accept? I move to accept the minutes as written. I second, second that. Okay, excellent. Uh, agenda item number five, update from complaint process wait, audits. Wait, 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 sorry. So we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes. A public comment and then take a vote. Oh, excuse me. Mm 
Mr. Sure you want to stand up for public comment, please? Absolutely. Thank you. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within the square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I will take all requests in the order that they are received. I will now pause for a moment for you to access this feature and submit your request. Mr. Chair, it does not appear that we have received any requests. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. <clears throat> okay, agenda item number five. Sorry, oh. we still have to vote. I'll, I'll do a quick roll call. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I know that Dr. Sullivan said we're going to make this a quick meeting, but I think we still have to vote on everything. <laughs> trying to follow his lead. Ms. <laughs> Pulaski. Christy? Yes. Okay. Ms. Jackman? Stewart? Yes. Dr. Lazarchev? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Abstain. Ms. Schaffeld? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Dr. Warner? Yes. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, agenda item number five, update from complaint process audit subcommittee. And um, what I'd like to do for this item is to just refer committee members and audience to the best um, summary of what has been performed in these last uh, five years on this subcommittee. And that was the January 22nd, 2019 meeting that we had at Davis. Um, you may recall there was a chronology of the subcommittee meetings, the presentations to the committee and uh, followed was uh, a short paragraph of the highlights of some of those uh, meetings that uh, at the time Bill Grant and I, and now uh, Dr. Lazarchev and I have done at the at the BMB since July of 2015 when we started. So we talked a lot about this. Um, I think it'll be more productive if we just uh, refer to that as the source of info and for anybody in the audience that um, wants to follow along, if you go to the VMB website, click on the tab about us, board meetings, uh, and scroll down to that date, January 22nd, 2019, you'll find the agenda items and uh, the webcast. So let me stop there and ask if anybody has any uh, comment or question at this point. Okay, then what I'd like to do today is just to review the goal of this um, subcommittee when it was established, um, primarily two elements. One was to identify areas of improvement in processing disciplinary cases. And two was to provide greater consistency in the application of the standard of care by expert witnesses reviewing cases. And I think the best way to um, go forward is to turn this over to Jessica and uh, enforcement manager, Rob Stephanopoulos, because heretofore I and Dr. Lazarchev um, have summarized in previous meetings what has been done up till now. And there's been um, a change in the uh, board's process of this, and I think Jessica will be in a position to describe it in better detail. Jessica? Sure. Um, and so 
there was a request, a recent request from one of the board members for the, the subcommittee to be used uh, to review the entire complaint process from start to finish and suggest any improvements um, to us. And so I think that the subcommittee can do that. However, right now we are in the middle of mapping our the entire process with DCA's uh, organization and all improvement office. Um, for mapping it from start to finish and identifying any redundant steps or, or unnecessary steps and um, we're identifying ways to streamline it. So what we would like to do is do that first and then potentially have the subcommittee review that once we have it all mapped out. We thought that would be a lot more productive than to just have conversations about what where the, what the process is. Um, it'd be helpful to have that visual and so we all are on the same page. Um, as far as changes that we've made, um, obviously we reported at the last meeting that the subcommittee, the enforcement team, and our DAG liaison revamped the expert witness guidelines. And in there, instead of um, making any determination on what specific law violations were done, they're focusing on the standard of care and the treatment that was provided. Uh, with that, uh, the, the subject matter experts are using that as guidelines. And once we get those reports uh, from the experts with the new format, then it's going to our in-house consultant to at that time to make sure that the standard of care was correctly applied. And it's, there's no biased comments in the reports. And that's a, a working draft that they that they do. And then once the consultant says that the 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 report is good, then it is finalized and that we include it as part of the um, of the enforcement file. So with that, we're able to capture whether or not the standard of care was was um, accurately identified uh, right up front rather than later when the discipline is already final. And we are identifying any potential concerns with the reports uh, again right up right up front. Uh, we feel like this is a much better use of, of resources. It streamlines the process. Um, those consultants aren't doing a full second report, which is also good. Um, and it, when you look at a lot of the concerns that the subcommittee has identified over time, a lot of it was with uh, incorrectly applying some statutes or regulations. Um, when you had two experts reviewing it, they just will find different violations and so they didn't match each other um, and it created a lot of confusion and it really it hurt cases in the long run because of the differing of, a, of not necessarily whether or not the standard of care was applied but the different law violations that were found uh, and so we we feel that this is a better way to accurately use our settlement experts um, and then the staff and the attorney general's office will be charged with identifying what specific statutes and regs fall into place. So that's that's what I have. Dr. Pollard, do you have any additional things to add to that that I may have left off? Yeah, I think I'd just add that I understand um, to your point about utilizing resources more effectively. You are also now utilizing the hospital inspectors to a greater degree than um, not at the exclusion of DOI, but certainly um, at a lower cost and I think more efficiently. Right. So in the past, and I think I mentioned this before, um, in the past, it was pretty standard for division investigations. Um, those are sworn peace officers to go out with our inspectors whenever we got a complaint. Uh, this caused a lot of delay because they wanted to coordinate some schedules. DOI had a uh, quite a bit of backlog. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that DOI doesn't necessarily have to be present for. Um, if we have questions regarding sanitary conditions, if we have uh, questions regarding medical records, our inspectors are trained to do that and not necessarily DOI. We still use DOI if we need to go and have them interview witnesses and get statements because our inspectors are not investigators. But for the most part, our inspectors are able to get a lot of information by just going out there. It also saves quite a bit of, of time because um, DMI uh, is, is not uh, quick. 
Uh, they're also uh, pretty expensive. <clears throat> for example, right now, the, the current rate for GFI is $302 an hour, and it's going to be a minimum of 20 hours for the easy cases. Uh, and our, inspection, our inspections is $250 per inspection. So as you can imagine, that, that's quite a bit of cost savings. Um, we are just being able to um, go meet to the 20% the mandate. Uh, and it's cutting down on time as well. Uh, does does Rob have any comments to add? Let's see. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, no, I was. I, I think you guys hit the nail on the head with with a lot of it. I think we're being more proactive when it comes to the the expert witnesses um, right now, and then having a, a new set of guidelines and then an example. Um, now we've got a specific veterinary um, review case as the sample in the guidelines. Um, and I think that that's pretty valuable. I know that we've gotten some feedback um, from some of our experts who have said that it's it's a lot more clear cut um, and it's it's um, easier to understand. Um, but when it comes to DFI, one of the other nice things about using inspections is um, a lot of our under well, the cases that we normally use DFI for an undercover, uh, because obviously we don't, inspectors aren't going to go out there undercover. Um, if we do have sanitary con concerns, where we're going to set on an inspector. Um, many times they can go out there during their normal inspection and they'll catch people performing services while being unlicensed, um, while they're actually going out there. So sometimes we can actually have inspections reveal something that we would normally think, oh, only DFI can go out and do an undercover. Um, but surprisingly, yeah, they've gone out to just do an inspection and they can see, hey, who's that person back there, you know, performing surgery. And um, I mean, I, I think I've, I've spoken volumes about the inspections team, but I, it's a really, really um, great resource that we have here at BMB is to, to turn to them. It's just a lot faster. It's so much cheaper. Um, it, it gets what we need quickly. Um, I mean, I know that we have had better, more frequent conversations with DFI and the, and the higher ups there um, to where they've prioritized a lot of our cases. And I know we've had a couple of recent cases that they've jumped on really, really quickly, which is great. Um, but we have really significantly um, reduced our usage of DFI uh, most of the time in favor of our inspection program. So that I think is a, a pretty big change, which I think in the future is going to save us a lot of money too. Um, and not only does it save the board money, it saves the respondents quite a bit of money as well. Um, because it, in any cases where we take discipline, all of that cost um, with DFI is is then sent down in the form of cost recovery to the respondents. So again, not only is it saving us money, but it's saving the respondents money as well. Uh, may I ask uh, Jessica and Rob what the status of expert witness training is at this point? Sure. So we had um, last year, we, we utilized the medical board's training, and that was seemed to be pretty successful from the ones who attended. Um, I, we, we are looking, obviously, because of COVID, we had to um, rethink that, that plan, but we are re reaching out to a medical board to see if they are, in, they are doing any kind of virtual training this year um, or even next year. Uh, and I know that DCA itself is also working on a on a subject matter expert training that we are we are assisting with. Um, I think it's been on hold for quite some time, but we we need to follow up with them and find out what that is. Another thing that we can do uh, work on this fiscal year is perhaps creating our own virtual training and potentially doing webinars and um, also maybe just recording it and being able to send it out to our experts so they can use it at any time. Uh, Dr. Lazarchev, any comments you'd like to add? I think that's pretty much summed it up. That's... Okay. Um, committee members, comments, questions? Any comments or questions from the audience? Moderator, please. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A feature for the public. In the ask field, 
Typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen type, I would like to make a public comment and send to all participants. Any other communication will not be responded to. I will take comments in the order that they are received. I will now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Dr. Pollard, it does not appear we have received any requests. Would you like me to go ahead and close this feature? Yes, please. This feature has been closed. Okay. Uh, moving on to agenda item number six, update and discussion on premise, premises registration fees. Uh, Dr. Sullivan and Christy Kowalski. Uh, thank you. Um, the memorandum pretty well explains everything. Uh, the survey was emailed last Friday. Uh, we are just starting to receive a few responses. Uh, there are approximately, and correct me, Tara and Jessica, if I'm wrong on this, but I think there's approximately 3,300 premises, and I think we have email addresses for about 50% of them. So. Um, if uh, our responses are not sufficient, I, I guess we could incorporate the questions into the renewal process, uh, but, uh, and that, but that would take much longer. So we're hoping that if we get a, a decent response to the survey, we can use that as uh, the data that we need to uh, uh, evaluate uh, if we can do the tiering process and, and what that would look like. Uh, we have gotten a couple of questions that I think I'll open to the, to the uh, whole uh, committee to address uh, since uh, they came in on kind of a timely basis. Uh, the first question was, uh, since the COVID problem, uh, we are not fully staffed. So do we respond with the pre-COVID uh, numbers or do we use the, the present uh, numbers that we have for staffing. So I think we could start with uh, we could start with some discussion on that question and then there was one other that I have. Gosh, that's a good question insofar as nobody knows when post-COVID status is going to happen. So well, and I'm actually torn with that question as well because I can speak from how I have and, you know, how I've started hiring in that we have actually hired more people than we anticipated um, because everybody is busier. So the emergency hospitals are have three hour wait times. And so we actually hired more doctors and more team members than we anticipated hiring. Because we thought, well, we better be prepared. And we're, we could be taking a huge hit, <laughs> but we are scared that we're going to be busier than we thought opening up. And so that's so where they're all going, and the rest of us can't get any of that. <laughs> Gee, thanks, Christy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Dr. Sullivan already got mad at me, and I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I really apologize for this. I've already had this conversation with him. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'm I'm concerned. It's like, because I think, is it going to be a nice mix? Because we're going to have, it, you know, we're going to have more people hiring or are we going to end then some that are less? Because we have, I think it depends on how they reacted. Did they close or did they, did they, I'm hearing from all of the posts when I read, when I talk to other people, that they're busier than they've ever been. And then you hear the cases where they've completely closed down. And I think those are the smaller hospitals. Those are the single doctor practices. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is. And so when I heard that question, it's very, 
Yeah. Uh, I would concur. I've been working at an emergency hospital, especially rural hospital, for the last month, and that uh, wait time is probably even three to four hours on any day of the week. And <clears throat> I don't know of many practices in the San Diego area where I am that have closed um, voluntarily. There have been six I'm aware of that have been closed temporarily for COVID reasons. But how long may I ask uh, Dr. Sullivan or Jessica, whoever might know, Christy, would it take once we come to a decision at whatever point we you know, draw the line for this, uh, for this tiered process? Let's say we just say, for example, two months from now, we close the survey, we collate the results, and we come up with a, a tiered fee, a new tiered fee process. How long from two months from now would it take to implement that and affect RBT licensees? Well, I would think it would have to go before the board uh, to become official. Uh, and then, um, and it may, well, Jessica can answer that, would, it may require some legislation. Yeah, it, it would. Uh, so it would go before the board for them to discuss. If the board agreed with the recommendations, um, as you all know right now, uh, all of the fees are at the fees, the statutory fee caps. And so uh, what we would do as part of our sunset legislation is request that the fee caps be raised. And uh, that would be raised um, with the premises registrations, whatever recommendations that the board had approved. Uh, if they do the tiered approach, then we would put it in the legislation for, to do the tiered approach. Uh, and then we would raise all the, the fees. There's a way to set a minimum fee in the statute uh, and a ceiling. And so if we were able to set the minimum fee, then we would be able to reduce the RVT fees. But again, that legislation uh, goes through the entire year process. So it wouldn't be until January of 2022 that it would take effect. And, and my guess, too, is with COVID, nothing's going to be going through anytime soon. So I would assume that it might even take longer because of COVID. Is that a pretty accurate assumption? Yeah, that makes sense. And as such, then it, it sort of minimizes the importance of that survey question, right? Um, because the numbers that they would answer today are going to be hopefully very different than they will be a year from now. This is Cheryl. Um, I think we should structure that question around pre-COVID because with the tiered, as I understand it, my impression, with the tiered uh, premise permit system that we're looking at, that would be in, per in perpetuity, right? This is going to be forever. And so I think we should look at the pre-COVID numbers um, and base it on that, knowing that, you know, all our hospitals change over time. We grow, we shrink, whatever. Um, but base it on pre-COVID, because at least we're all basing it on the same thing. Um, and then um, develop a tiered system and then, and then that, just go forward with that. That makes good sense to me. I would agree with that because I answered that survey with post-COVID answers. I didn't even think about that, how much different it is pre and post. I see it as, as a continuum. Um, I think that I would like to see it as a question with every, uh, with, with every premises a renewal uh, and at intervals, maybe three years or five years that it gets looked at again because you know, normally the process of uh, most clinics is over time, they do get larger. So uh, I think those dynamics, uh, especially with the corporate purchases, I think those dynamics uh, are changing every year. So I think we need to keep following that. So I have a question about, uh, so we get the survey and that because, I mean, e even a good survey, if a 20% response rate is a good so what do we do with what do we do with that information? Because you're not going to get information on you know the majority of practices certainly. Well, we're so trying how, to we're using, 
we're trying to see if we, if using a um, tiered registration fee is going to be able to make up the difference that we need because we know how much money we need to make up. If we lower the the fees for our RVTs, what, how much money do we need to make up? Right. So, so need, it's almost a million dollars. Correct. And so we need, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a million. We're, we're basically looking at a million dollars that we need to be able to make up in those fees. So what, how much do we need to make up? And, and if, if we obviously don't think we can make up a million dollars at what price point can we make okay. up? So are you, so say you get a 20% response rate again, cause that's <clears throat> with all sir, <clears throat> sorry, I'm hoarse. Um, with all surveys, I mean, 20% is great for a response rate. But say you get 20%, then you're going to assume that that 20% is representative of all the practices in the state? Is that what we're kind of looking at? Well, I'm, we're hoping for a percentage a little higher than that. And I would say that if we don't get an adequate percentage or an adequate reflection of what's going on, then we shift to asking the question on the renewal process. Because if okay. this is going to take a year, uh, if we can get it incorporated into the renewal process, we can get a lot, of, a lot more accurate information in at least, you know, I mean, even in nine, ten months. So that's kind of what I see as the backup. To answer the question okay. on the on the uh, revenue generated, I, I at least I was not looking at reducing the RVT fees down to what they were, but reducing them. Uh, s significantly. So I'm not sure that we're looking okay. at a million dollars. Okay. Right. And that's, yeah, it's, it's to what price point can we reduce it to? Correct. And that's what I'm trying to say. It's at what point, price point can we reduce it? We're not going to make up a million dollars. It's, that's not even realistic, but to what price point can we reduce it to? So if the, so there's about, is according to the, uh, what I read in my further materials, so there's about 3,360 premises. So you take that 995,000 divided by the number of premises. So it's about $300 of practice. If you, if you were gave it across the board, even. So it's about $300 of practice. So, I mean, I think that's, and if you kept, you know, a single doctor practice at, what is it now, $400 um, and raised, I mean, I think it's doable. What is oh, yeah. the location number? <laughs> What's the duration of a permit permit? Is it two years like the veterinary license? One year. That's one, one year. year. Okay. Okay. So I agree. I think in, in two months, we're going to get a, a very good idea as to what kind of response we're getting. Uh, and then we either make a recommendation or we try plan B. So on the premise permit renewals, can we start now with getting that information? That's actually what I was just going to ask. Is it possible to do both now, and or do we have to wait? So it would take some. It would take some time um, because right now we are we're utilizing the the emails that are tied to the um, premises, and so uh, we've already utilized the emails. So if we're going to do an insert. Uh, with a paper renewal, it's going to take some time for our team to put that together and then implement it. Um, so I don't, I don't have an exact time frame for you, but um, actually, Patty, our inspection manager, just reminded me that the bulk of the premises renewals renew in May, um, and so we're looking at at least a year before we uh, get those results. Because if if they renew in May, obviously May is past. Um, and 90% of them renew at that time. And also, the uh, we'd have a crossover. We wouldn't know. We, we couldn't do it at the same time because we get a response from the emails and then a response from the renewals. We wouldn't know which ones were matched without sitting down and going through each one individually. So I think we do try the uh, emails first. And if we're not getting an adequate response, then go to plan B. Well, in that case, uh, the next it looks, it looks like Tara is trying to speak, but Tara, we can't hear you. Thank you. 
Um, my phone was on mute. Um, the board can only collect information as part of the renewal that it is statutorily authorized to collect. So if you want to tie the um, premises information to the renewal, it still has to be in the form of a survey or voluntary information. You can't just add it to the renewal application as a requirement unless you go through the statutory process. Right, and I would really recommend um, doing that to make it optional. Um, and it would just go into an insert for them to do. Uh, obviously, to make it a requirement would require more reg changes, and that's not fast. So uh, I definitely think the optional survey is, is the way to go. Any other thoughts? I was I was thinking that given the next meeting is October, that's uh, gosh, coming up faster than than uh, we probably are aware. Three months ago seems like such a long time, but in three months, I I should think that the majority of any survey respondents are going to have answered. Wouldn't you think, Dick? I would think so. Yes. So uh, maybe we could uh, plan for the next meeting to uh, to have those collated and um, and then move on that information. Sounds good. What about sending out the survey again? I think that's things that the some of the pollers do. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll, we'll most likely be sending out some reminder emails. Uh, and part of the survey, they're identifying their premises registration number. So if we have a spreadsheet, we can check off who's responded and who has not responded. Uh, I mean, there's other avenues that we can explore as well, potentially just calling some of them too if they haven't responded after multiple reminders. Uh, and we can try it that way. Thanks. Any other committee comments? Uh, moderator, may we open it up to public comment, please? Absolutely. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q&A panel for public comment. If you would like to make a comment, please click on the icon with a question mark in the center of your WebEx screen. I'm sharing instructions on the screen for your reference. In the ask field, please type, I would like to make a public comment and send it to all panelists. I will take comments in the order that they are received. I will now pause a moment for you to access the Q&A panel and submit your requests. Mr. Chair, it does not appear we have received any requests. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. This feature has been closed. Okay, so um, Christy and uh, Dr. Sullivan, any other uh, thoughts planning for the next meeting? This will obviously continue on the agenda. No, we'll just uh, update everything at that point and go from there. Okay, moving on, agenda item number seven, election of officers. So uh, we have um, myself terming off, so a veterinarian will be interviewed and voted onto the committee tomorrow or Friday by the VMB. And so today, at this time, I would like to entertain a motion or motions for a new MDC chair. Don't everybody speak at once. I would nominate Christy Pulowski to be the MDC chair. I second that. Second. Okay. Uh, 
remind me, Jessica, do we? Yeah. So, Ms. Pulaski, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I have construction going on. I'm trying to stay muted because it's getting louder. Okay. So, since we have a motion of second, and Ms. Pulaski has accepted the nomination, if you would have put a comment quickly and then we can take a vote. Moderator, with my oh, oh, sorry. This is the moderator, and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the Q and A panel for public comment. In the ask field, typically in the lower right of the WebEx screen, type "I would like to make a public comment" and send it to all panelists. Any other comments will not be responded to. I will take comments in the order that they are received, and I will now pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q and A panel and submit their request. Mr. Chair, it does not it does not appear that we have received any requests. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. This feature has been closed. Christy Palowski, next chair of MDC. Congratulations. Okay. Sorry, I had to do a quick vote. Um, oh, fast. sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. He really is trying I'm, to make this I'm go. racing. <laughs> Ms. Palowski. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Ekman? Mr. Ekman? Stuart, it looks like you're on mute. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. How do you vote? Yes. Okay. Dr. Lesserton? Yes. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Ms. Felt? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Dr. Warner? Yes. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Pollard? Yes. All right. Congratulations, Ms. Pulaski. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to just um, add my committee chair comments to, at this time, to say that. Oh, uh, don't we need a vice chair? We need a vice chair. Um, yeah. Do we need to vote on that today? Yes. Yes, I would recommend to nominate a vice chair and have a vote as well. Okay. Can I nominate Kevin Lazar, chef, please? I second that. Uh, can I respectively just decline and nominate Dick Sullivan, please? No, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> Respectfully, I think I can do more damage as a member than I can as a vice chair. Ah. All righty then. Already then what? That was successful. <laughs> yeah. Did he parry that that well? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know that I'm, I, well, it's not going to have any more responsibilities really than anything else unless something happens to Christy. So uh, I, I'll go ahead and accept it. Good. Okay. So then we need to go to public comment and then we can take a vote. This is the moderator and at the direction of the committee, I have opened the feature for public comment. It is not necessary to identify yourself in order to make a public comment. I will take the comments in the order they are received. <clears throat> I will pause a moment to give the public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their request.
Mr. Chair, no requests have been received. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. This feature is now closed. Okay. Um, Dick may have been right. Uh, Wait, please go. Just let me let me real fast. <laughs> Okay, Ms. Pulaski. <laughs> All right, um, Mr. Edwin. Mr. Edwin, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Did you vote? Yes. Oh, thank you. Dr. Lazarchev. Ms. Laredo? Yes. Ms. Schaffelt? Yes. Dr. Sullivan? Yes. Dr. Warner? Yes. Dr. Waterhouse? Yes. Dr. Pollard? Yes. All right. Motion carries. Congratulations, Dr. Lazarchin. It sounds like you're super excited. <laughs> <laughs> super excited. <laughs> It looks like you're driving. I hope it's safe. Yeah, I'm being chauffeured. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, chair and vice chair set. So that brings us to agenda item number eight, future agenda items, committee priorities, and meeting dates. Um, <clears throat> I made a list of the um, agenda items that the MDC has dealt with over the last six years that I've been on the committee. And they are, as most of us will remember, minimum standards, RVT alternate route, RVT student exemptions, university licensure, animal rehab, uh, dental extractions by RVTs, dental radiography, cannabis guidelines, complaint process audit, and corporate medicine. Um, so future agenda items include some of these. Uh, clearly the uh, cannabis guidelines pending current legislation and the complaint process audit are going to continue. I would like to see at some point the MDC with the VMB's direction consider telemedicine. I would like to see dental radiography be revisited. And the not sure the current terminology, but I think I've read uh, nurse initiative slash RVT. Um, I think that's a longer term goal. Those items come to mind as current and uh, near future topics on my list. Committee members? Um, I would, this is Cheryl. I would like to have um, the board um, decide if they would like the MDC to discuss if we should have uh, some limitation on the number of premises that one MGL can be the signature on. Um, so I guess so. essentially what we're discussing is the duties of an MGL and how many premises can one MGL really realistically um, manage. Other items from anybody else's list? Uh, moderator, may we? I'm sorry, Dr. Paula, before you get started, I just wanted to say um, one thing that may potentially come up, and I know it's gonna be brought up during future agenda items uh, at the board meeting, is um, having the NDC visit the AC requirement and uh, whether or not it's tied to the uh, the veterinarian or if it's tied to the clinic 
right now how it's structured, the VCPR is tied to the veterinarian, but you have the situations where you have some um, veterinarians providing care as follow-ups, um, and there's some some confusion and some questions as to um, how that VCPR needs to be reestablished for each each veterinarian. Um, and so that will most likely come up at the uh, uh, board meeting tomorrow as future agenda items. I, I'm so just, sorry, Jessica, there was some static and I, I missed a good portion of what I, I heard parts of EPCR, but I'm gonna ask you to repeat that, please. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll go a little quicker. It's really just having the MDC look at uh, the VCPR requirement and if it's tied, it was since it's tied to a specific veterinarian, how that plays out in practice when it comes to tie the veterinarians there and veterinarians uh, providing follow-up care, um, and also how that ties into telemedicine. So it's a it's a much bigger topic, but that's one of the things that one of the board members may bring up during future agenda items tomorrow. So if the VPCR is tied to a specific veterinarian or to the managing licensee. No. Um, so when you have a, a clinic with multiple veterinarians there, so you have one veterinarian establish the VCPR, um, and then if there's other veterinarians in the clinic and that animal needs to have some follow-up care, is the VCPR tied to still that initial veterinarian or if other veterinarians are able to use that VCPR to treat the animal? And then how that also plays into the current uh, VCPR telemedicine waivers uh, for that initial VCPR that's established. Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, remind me, do we need public comment? We should take public comment, yes. They can propose future agenda items. Yes. Uh, moderator, please. This is the moderator. The Q&A panel has been opened. If you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within the square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. I am sharing the instructions now. In the ask field, please type, I would like to make a public comment and send to all panelists. Any other communication will not be responded to. I will take comments in the order they are received. I will now pause a moment to give public time to access the Q&A panel and submit their requests. Mr. Chair, we have received a request to make a public comment. An individual identified as Nancy would like to make a public comment. Nancy, I am unmuting your mic now. You will be given two minutes to speak and then a 30-second warning. Your mic is unmuted. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry I was unable to uh, to figure out how to, how to introduce myself at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> my comment is that uh, I would like the MDC to look into uh, approving applications from RVTs who are graduates of uh, RVT schools in other countries that are not already approved in our practice act. I, I have a an RVT from England, graduated from a four year RVT program at a at a public university, and she is unable to, to get uh, certified here because she doesn't meet our normal criteria. She's an excellent candidate. It'd be a shame to lose her. She said that she now, well, if we can't, she can't do California, she's going to think about moving to another state. Uh, so I, I don't see any reason why uh, the Veterinary Medical Board can't review applications like this, just like they review alternate route applications. And these are even simpler than alternate route applications. She has a complete transcript. So I would like the MDC to, to look into that. Mr. Chair, no other requests have been received. Would you like me to close this feature? Yes, please. Uh, last item of agenda item eight is the future meeting dates. So may we check the calendar, Jessica? 
Sure. The only other um, date that we have finalized is October 21st for the MDC meeting. It will most likely be another virtual meeting. Um, and uh, we have not set the 2021 calendar yet. Okay, great. Well, everybody, it's been fun. Good to see you. Very yeah, much uh, all your work. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Yes. Thank you for being a great chair. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Pollard, for serving, and thank you for being a chair. You're here. Thank you. Thank Appreciate you very it. much. We're going to miss you. going to miss our flights. <laughs> okay. Uh, time to adjourn. <laughs> move. Yeah, I move for that. <laughs> Second. We actually don't need a okay. just <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. How do you get out of here?